What's it firing? What's it firing into? There was a time in which we didn't know there were individual neurons. There was a time in which we didn't know any of this stuff that we learned in college, right? All of this stuff has been discovered through scientific process, at least the science side of the house. Arts have been examined scientifically too. How do people decide whether something's good art or bad art? Isn't that a personal psychological variable, right? Their brains are perceiving the same stimuli, but making radically, indifferent, radically different interpretations of the same stimuli. So in other words, everybody's reality is not the same. It's different based on who you are. What I got here in this little schematic is a neuron. You see way, way, way on down that road. And how long could this thing be? It could be a couple feet long, literally. Right? I got to get the signal from my spinal cord all the way down to my big toe. That's an axon that goes all the way down there. All right? And I got to travel it all the way up the spinal cord into the brain. But here I got my projected figure where I got way back there these little dendrites and they're summing up neurotransmitter activity, especially inner neurons. That's all they're going to do is summate and fire, summate and not fire. If it ever reaches the, the firing potential, then the message received is not to fire. And that's still information, all right? Zeros are still information. If I get it to the point where it fires, it's going to send it on down that axon, skip it across that set of nodes of Ranvier, which are gaps between the myelin sheath, those little cells, Schwann cells wrapped around it, and it's going to hit the terminal knob. Now we're looking at the terminal knob. We're looking at the end of the line. And what's in the end of the line? Little vesicles, little, little bubble sacs, if you will, full of molecules. What molecules are in those? Neurotransmitters. Things like serotonin, dopamine, acetylcholine. There's lots of them. We don't even know if we found them all yet. It's entirely possible we haven't. We know of dozens. There are some big ones in the sense that you are likely to know them. We will talk about them, especially in their relationship to mental health and well-being, right? Do so y'all know of antidepressant medications? Some of those are called SSRIs. There's SSNRIs. There's all kinds of things. Neurotransmitters are what those are referring to. Serotonin, manipulating levels of serotonin. Or norepinephrine. Or in other cases, dopamine. The neurotransmitters are just chemicals, the molecules that we're talking about now, and they're stored in presynaptic vesicles. Well, what's presynaptic mean? This area out here is the synapse. The area between the end of one neuron and the beginning of another is called the synapse. They used to think it was just one big continuous network, but it turns out it's not. The space in between here we're not talking so much millimeters as nanometers. We're talking meters though, right? We're talking about distance. These are not continuous entities. There is space between them. And so when we get the release of these neurotransmitters from these vesicles because the action potential fired all the way down to the terminal area, it's now disgorging or dumping by fusing with the membrane its contents, whatever neurotransmitter that might be, into this area that we call the synapse. And it floats around like space. Right? It's not like throwing a dart to your target. It just dumps a bunch of them. And the idea is that if there's a receptor over here, one of them's going to make its way across to it and lock in. If there's multiple receptors, multiple may lock in, but some of them are just going to float off into intracellular space or extracellular space. Intra, inter, extra. You got me. They're going to float away. Why is it going to float away? Because there's nothing holding it here, really. They can't just float away forever because otherwise your whole synaptic areas will be cluttered. So you have these enzymes that break them down. Acetylcholinase. Y'all know ASE, right? That's an enzyme. It's going to break it down into its constituent parts. Or, if it's floating off, it may actually come back around and make contact with, contact with the same neuron that fired it. And in some cases, for some neurotransmitter, there are active protein pumps and it'll catch it. 
And it'll bring it back in and transport it back up into the soma. And in a very efficient process, rather than wasting it, it'll repackage it and use it again. That's stunning, isn't it? What? It knows to do that? It does know to do that. And in fact, when you start looking at how certain antidepressant drugs work, when we're looking at serotonin as an example, some of them, right, are MAOI inhibitors. Monoamine oxidase, meaning an enzyme that is inhibited so that it doesn't work anymore and it doesn't break down those monoamines, one of which is serotonin, in the synapse so there's more of them drifting around. Or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors means that the reuptake process is blocked. So rather than pulling them back in and packaging them, it just leaves them floating around, which means there's more neurotransmitters now available in this synaptic space. But people misunderstand when they talk about chemical imbalances. It's an easy metaphor for people to understand, but it's not exactly accurate. If there was a chemical imbalance where you just didn't have enough serotonin, then taking one of these medications would instantly fix the issue because instantly it goes into action and instantly more serotonin, not instantly, you know, there's time, it's got to be ingested, it's got to go through the digest, right, hepatic first pass. But once it gets there and, and starts its action, it's working. But it doesn't become effective for two to four weeks because it turns out that's not the issue so much and we don't know why it is. But you would think with more neurotransmitters out in the synapse, you'd need more receptors to account for them, but the opposite happens. They downregulate. And the downregulation, in other words, the degrading number of receptors available for that specific neurotransmitter, that process takes about two to four weeks before it becomes an effective mood changing agent. So it's not quite as straightforward as people would like to make it. And we'll start there on Wednesday. Y'all have a great day. See you then. This is where we left off. We talked about the neurotransmitters. Just to give a quick summary of this neuron, we got the dendrites out here that receive signals, meaning they receive neurotransmitters. They engage in those receptors. Sometimes they open them, sometimes they close them, but when they open them up, that allows your positive ions in the cations, cations. It's going to increase the polarity of the cell. If it reaches threshold, bam, it fires all or none, right? When it fires, it's firing an electrical charge. So we've gone from chemical to electrical, which is why we say the whole system is electrochemical. Fires the impulse down the axon, causes the neurotransmitters, which are stored in these things called vesicles, to fuse. The vesicles will fuse with the membrane and disgorge or dump their contents into this place we call the synapse. So this neuron is presynaptic and this neuron is postsynaptic because the synapse is in between them. That's going to be important in just a second. But it's as simple as that. Just keep in mind the synapse is the gap between in which these neurotransmitters are floating hoping to dock with a postsynaptic neuron. If they don't, they can float off into space, so to speak, extracellular space, and they might be dissolved by enzymes, right? Or they may be captured by the original emitting presynaptic neuron and taken back in, taken back to the soma, repackaged into a vesicle to save resources. So that's a pretty amazing thing. If it fires, it's a one. If it doesn't fire, it's a zero. So it's binary communication summated across massive numbers of neurons. And when we get into this postsynaptic potential thing, you now have a basis for understanding that. That's pretty clear, I hope. Postsynaptic, meaning what? After the synapse. So we're talking about the neuron that's receiving a signal, the chemical signal. Right, the electrical signal went down the axon, caused the terminal knob to release neurotransmitters, right, into the synapse. Now, the next one in the chain is the postsynaptic neuron. So now the question is, what's that neuron gonna do? So it has the potential to fire or not fire, right? In some ways, you can think of it that simply. It has the potential to fire or to not fire. So we have two types of potentials then, excitatory and inhibitory. 
and they are pretty much what they sound like if you're thinking about it. If you just look at those terms, you're like, man, that's looking like a bunch of jargon and gobbledygook. I don't know what that means. Break it down. Postsynaptic, it's receiving neurotransmitters, right? They might open up the receptors and let in those cations, in which case that shift in voltage is going towards the threshold, right? If it reaches that threshold, it fires, right? That's action potential. Are we down with that? Everybody's got that, okay? So as it increases in voltage, you're getting excited. It's getting ready to fire, it's getting ready to fire, and that's excitatory, right? It's moving towards the positive, moving towards the threshold. But keep in mind that zero is also information. Zero and one, both are important, so not firing could happen as well. It has the potential to not fire. So it could be that it's getting neurotransmitters that cause the receptors to close up, right? In other words, shift the voltage away from firing, which is to inhibit the voltage, so to speak, inhibit the potential, so it's less likely to fire. That's pretty straightforward, but that's neuronal communication. That's happening every second that you exist on so many levels that it's impossible to conceive. Thousands and thousands of these things are happening in an eye blink, right? You got the idea from action potential slide we talked about. This is happening on the order of milliseconds and it happens repeatedly because when the vesicles disgorge, they don't disgorge all the vesicles, there's more stored up and there's always more being produced. So you have the ability to do whatever you do all day, every day, so long as you get enough sleep and enough nutrients and live within the parameters of human life.